Hi there. What I'm sitting next to here is an absolute piece of engineering brilliance created by the Tektronix company back in 1959. This 555 dual beam oscilloscope is put together like a Swiss watch. It's got porcelain substrate wafers throughout. Every part and piece inside of this oscilloscope is put in there by hand, by critical assembly line workers, and then soldered with silver solder. I'm surprised they didn't use gold solder. They're just, uh, where did they stop here? You know, absolutely impossible to make something like this today. So this oscilloscope in itself is a real beast. It weighs in at 113 pounds with its separate power supply. It has over 100 vacuum tubes inside it. This thing not only is a piece of test gear, it's an area heater for those long winter nights while you stare at the, the pretty screen uh, displaying the traces. This is a dual beam oscilloscope, not a dual trace oscilloscope. There's a difference. The dual trace oscilloscope uses one gun and toggles between the upper and lower trace. One gun only. This has got two guns in one CRT with eight deflection plates and it uh, is essentially two oscilloscopes in one. This guy here has got two separate time bases, two separate input modules, and two separate guns for two separate traces. So if I want to look at 25 hertz on the top and 25 megahertz on the bottom, it'll do it with ease and I can look at them both. No problems, they don't interfere with each other or anything. This guy here is, is on a, a, a Tektronix mobile cart here because they're very hard to move around. It's pretty heavy, 113 pounds. You don't want to be carrying this thing around and its associated power supply. They did put handles on them. Uh, I don't know whether that was something comical that uh, Tektronix did, but I guess they intended. They should have put more like side rack handles on these things. It's heavy. So this guy here was given to me by a ham radio operator that I helped get his transmitter working for him. And he says, you know what, hey Paul, come and get this thing, I really appreciate your help. And I said, wow, thanks a lot, I appreciate that. So I went over to his house and picked it up with a cart and, uh, you know, uh, the power supply and a bunch of probes and uh, some other odds and ends he gave me too, which is really nice. So I figured this is a perfect oscilloscope of the, you know, the Tektronix family to show because really this is absolute engineering brilliance, these guys. The way that these things are put together is just absolutely astounding. Now, people say that, that tubes are um, <clears throat> undependable. They say that, you know, uh, you know uh, tubes weren't very dependable. Well, this is a 547 oscilloscope here, and I've got another one beside it. Never had to replace a tube in it, not even once. I've owned them for 12 to 15 years now, and every time I turn them on, they operate. I didn't even change the electrolytic caps. you got to keep in mind that Tektronix used only top-notch stuff inside their uh, oscilloscopes. Uh, this wasn't intended for, you know, Joe Blow to go down to the store and buy one of these things. This thing was 2600 bucks back in 1959 money. Yikes. That's a lot of cash. So, and that's a bare bones unit. No plugins, no probes, no scope cart, no nothing. You're not walking home with this thing. I'm telling you, you're spending some pretty good money. This thing's got to, you know, you know, be forklifted out of there with its power supply unless you're taking them both separately because you can't carry this and the power supply at once. There's just no way. That power supply is a two hand job. Same with this scope. These have got uh, handles on the top here too. You know, one here and one here so you can kind of, you know, move it around like so, but still not a very comfortable piece of gear to be moving around. There is some iron in this. They, they do have a transformer in here and uh, you can see it right through the side of the case here. Now I haven't opened this thing up. I haven't done nothing to it. I just brought it home and I figured this is uh, perfect for a video. So to, just to show tech, uh, Tektronix and uh, the way that they put things together. So we're going to open this thing up and look inside of it and uh, check out all those vacuum tubes and uh, see if they glow. Now, as I was saying earlier, you know, a lot of people don't think tubes are very dependable. Well, this thing's got over 100 of them inside of it. If I turn that switch on and this thing shows me some traces on it, uh, I think I have some argumentation ground there because, uh, you know, that's 100 vacuum tubes. You know, who knows if they've been replaced throughout time, but, you know, this thing's been probably bumped around. It's got scuffs and nicks and writing and stuff all over it. So, you know, I'm going to restore the thing properly, but... This is kind of neat to show it in its, uh, in its kind of its rough state. So uh, 
let's go inside and, and check out all the spiders in the dust and then uh, let's put some power to it and uh, see some oscilloscope traces. No smoke. Hi, so here we are looking at the side of the oscilloscope. I've removed all the other sides just to make it a little bit easier and quicker. This one here I've left on so that I can show you how the sides of these scopes come off. They're very easy to get off uh, for quick servicing. So we've got these two screws here and all that you need to do is put a screwdriver in there and give it just a bit of a turn and same with this guy, give it a bit of a turn put your hands on the top of the case, pull it towards yourself and then lift and the case is off. You can see inside there's just a little nylon nut with a bunch of tangs on it and it hits this piece of the case here and it stops the nut from turning so you just need to give it about a turn or so usually until the nuts loose and then the friction of the screw in the nut will cause it to hit that little tang and then it just loosens off. So you can see down in here all the tubes in the delay line and we can also see all the tubes here in the time base and up top the tubes below the calibration section and there's a magnifying uh, section in here and all sorts of stuff. This is a, a high voltage case. There's a whole bunch of tubes that are soldered in under this case, the high voltage rectifiers. And it's the same on the other side here. This case is much bigger and uh, there may be a few more rectifiers in there. I haven't removed the tops of the cases yet so I couldn't tell you. It looks like there's four in the other one and there maybe is uh, two or so in this one. Yeah, there's two in this one and four in this guy over here. So that's that. Let's uh, zoom in here. We can kind of see the uh, porcelain wafers that they've put in here. This is all silver soldered. All of this stuff is all silver soldered and the resistors you can see how meticulous they are. They've cut all the leads on the resistors and placed them perfectly center in the in the middle of these strips. And the reason they don't want you to use regular solder is you can see in here there's a little horseshoe. You see the little horseshoes in here that they're they're kind of attached to the porcelain wafer. If you use regular solder it'll break that bond and uh, those little horseshoes will come out of the uh, the porcelain. So the silver solder helps it stay in the uh, in the porcelain. They don't want you to wreck it so they usually included a roll of silver solder in these. I haven't found the roll in this one. Maybe this one they didn't do it um, or maybe it was something later they did. I have no idea. So that's this side of the scope. Let's zoom back out. That's the side of the scope. You really can't see any of the tubes in the plug-in here. So what I'll do is I'll turn the scope around and we'll look at the other side and you'll be able to see the tubes in the plug-in and because uh, you know the plug-ins both face the same way so the tubes are on the other side. Alright so here we are on the other side. You see the delay line here again. You can see all the tubes in the plug-in. So these plug-ins come out just by undoing this nut down here on the bottom. All you got to do is just unscrew this. The scope has to be off to do this or you'll damage things in the scope, especially the newer ones that have got transistors in them. These ones didn't really care all that much, but it's not good practice to uh, change these with the scope on. So you just pull the unit out and you can replace this with another plug-in. So this plug-in here, as you can see all the tubes in the in this guy here and they're all meticulously put together, all you know, high high quality Tektronix stuff. So that just plugs in very simply. It's that quick to get these out, that quick to put them back in. So you just put the thing back in. They slide in with ease. They have nice polished rods in here, and they just slide in with ease. And then you just give it a bit of a push, and then the connector makes contact in the back. And you wind this little screw in on the bottom and just snug it tight and that holds the plug in and that's all it is. So you see the tubes in the time base here and there's more tubes up on the top here and uh, there's tubes hiding in behind here and then there's a whole bunch of tubes on this little platform in here in the back they're all facing in this way and uh, we can see the fan in the back there let's see if it even rotates let's see if I can make that uh, turn my flashlight here to aid in there you can see the fan in the back so what I'm going to do is give this a bit of a, yeah, it moves. Yeah, it actually moves quite nicely still. I've noticed in a lot of the tech fans that those really don't move all that, all that nicely. They, uh, they really, um, <laughs> they're really gummed up. So you need to, 
to first clean them usually with a, uh, a fine solvent or a WD-40 and then when you're done you have to lubricate them properly with oil. If you ever leave uh, like a WD-40 in there uh, it washes the bearings right out so you need to put a, a, the proper oil in there after you've cleaned them you just can't WD-40 them. You can see the filter caps, the filter cans down in here, these uh, big filter cans back in here. You can see the big transformer, you can just see the iron of the transformer here, right here. This is the, the size of the core, so, you know, core's about that big, a couple inches thick. Pretty heavy transformer in there, that's what makes this guy so heavy, part of it. And um, so that's the d construction, you can see the porcelain wafers again throughout, and everything is beautifully centered, and and uh, all of the potentiometers and everything is just mounted just perfectly. It's really, uh, really quite a, uh, an engineering feat to put one of these things together, all done by hand. So what we'll do next is we'll look at the power supply. Hi there. So here we are looking at the power supply. You can see inside the power supply here are all the filter cans and some resistors on the side there. And we can see the uh, 6AS7s or 6080s and all the associated tubes that are hooked to these to make them regulate properly. This is a very interesting tube down here, this 2AS15. That's what does the filament voltage regulation through a, uh, a saturatable reactor. Is that a word? Saturatable? It's a, a reactor that uh, saturates. So we'll look into that and see all of the tubes here. And the fan, does the fan move? That's not bad. It might turn on. And here we have the uh, thermal kick out right down in here. So if you leave the filter for too long without cleaning it and it plugs, that'll sense the temperature of the chassis and, and shut the thing off. So that's kind of a quick overview of the power supply. All the heavy iron in here, big transformer here, another one here, another one here. You see they offset the handle to the front of the unit because all the weight's up the front. So there you go. So next let's uh, put some power to it. I've got all the cords hooked up. So I'll just mount this and uh, we'll hook some juice to it. Okay, so here's the moment of truth. I've got kind of the knobs centered. These guys are at uh, 9 o'clock here. I've kind of pre-centered all the knobs on the oscilloscope so that when I fire it up, I don't know if this thing's going to emit smoke, right? So I kind of want to have things all ready to go, kind of things all centered all at once. So uh, when I click the switch, which is on the main power supply down there, um, I'll be able to quickly work on this. Now there's a thermal delay in there, so it'll power up. If it does turn on and it'll wait a little bit, there'll be a click and then uh, maybe we'll have some action on this. So uh, let's see, I should probably have this on A. I just noticed that now. A. So it'll basically only use this, these two parts of the plug-in. The vertical's all centered, the intensity's kind of uh, sitting at 9 o'clock, the focus is straight up and down, and uh, the time base is on uh, 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 2 milliseconds uh, per centimeter, so what, it, it basically eliminates the flicker. So it should, uh, at least in the camera, it'll it'll look uh, it'll look pretty uh, pretty stable. So here we go. Let's click the switch on and hopefully it uh, hopefully it powers up. What do you think? Let's go. Oh, well, we got light. That's a little bit of a noise in the fan there, boys. That that's noisy. Both fans are on, and I see tubes lighting up. Let's zoom into that. See that they're uh, they're lighting up. So we should hear a click here soon. Move this so it's centered. See. Centered there. Oh, I hear a click, and I don't see anything. Not yet. The graticule's lit up. Oh, we have a bottom trace and a top trace. And it's a little bit defocused. 
uh, I'm going to grab a, my lens hood here. Pick up a lens hood here. It's a Tektronix lens hood. It has a little dimple in there that fits into a little hole on the top here. This cowl looks like it's been used pretty extensively. So it's scuffed up. So it's probably had a camera strap to it. And it would make sense because this phosphor here looks like a, a P, about a P5, possibly. Let's move it around and find out. Uh, what am I looking for here? Vertical position. Yeah, it's not leaving any green streamers. So if it was leaving a, a green streamer, see a, a blue phosphor is a P5. If it was leaving a, a, a green streamer, it could be a, a higher P number. So this is looking like a P5 to me or so. So not a standard phosphor, probably as I say intended for a camera. Let's put this on, hopefully you can see this through here. Yeah, you can. Okay, so this is not very bright to my eyes, but this is very bright in the camera. So it would indicate that it was definitely intended for that purpose to have a camera strap to it. Maybe there's some sort of a UV component in there, not sure. But it's, uh, it's pretty sensitive to this, this camera here. So what I'm going to do is uh, focus this. That's the bottom one that's defocused. Here it is. Got a nice focus to it. And the upper one is focused. So we have two traces in there. It's working pretty good. Let's see if we can get four. I'm going to take the module down here and put it to chopped. And turn this one to chopped. There we go. We have two traces on the bottom. This one should be on the bottom. And this one should be up a bit. And the upper one. There we go. We have four traces. So what it's doing right now, it's got two guns. And this one gun on the top is doing the two. So technically, one gun is doing a dual trace right now. This is a dual beam scope doing a dual trace function. How's that for confusing? So this is a, a dual beam, so this is running dual trace on the, the upper beam, and this is running dual trace on the lower beam. Bring that up so they're about equally as brilliant. You see it's out of alignment, they exceed the graticule inside there. Graticule really showing up all that bright. If I turn the intensity down, you might see the graticule a little better. So the graticule is, uh, see it's kind of dim. They give you an option, you can turn the graticule around and have it white. White is supposed to be better for uh, uh, photography and red is just better for the human eye to, to see it. Red contrasts blue pretty nicely. So that's what they're doing here. So it's, it's functioning properly. So I guess it kind of blows our theory on, uh, well not my theory, but people's theory on undependable tubes. Over a hundred of them in here, and it's working. No problems. Not a single part replaced. Just turned it on. I don't smell any smoke. I do smell... It smells like maybe uh, fan oil, like motor oil. And uh, carbon resistors, maybe some, some that, that neat smell of dusty tubes. Hot, dusty tubes. Move this around here. Look at the side. Zoom that in a bit. See all the tubes glowing. All them in the module here. And everything. So what we'll do is we'll look inside the power supply now. I'll shut this thing down and uh, we'll look inside the uh, supply and look at its schematic and check out the filament regulation technique. Pretty neat re uh, regulation technique they've done in there. All right. Here we have the regulated heater supply portion of the schematic of my 555 Tech Dual Beam Oscilloscope. I'm just going to explain this small part of the schematic because this really is a unique design by Tech and kind of warrants a bit of an explanation. So this circuit is responsible for regulating all the heater voltages in the entire oscilloscope. And how it does this is with this saturable reactor in line with the primary of T750. So how this circuit works, I, I kind of have to introduce a problem and explain how this corrects it. 
So these are all, all these windings go to different parts of the oscilloscope and power up different clusters of tubes. These are all supposed to be at 6.3 volts. So we'll say they're at 6.1 volts and this circuit is now going to try and correct it and bring it back into regulation. And this is how it would do it. So if this is at 6.1 volts here, this heater inside of this 2AS15 is going to be a little bit cooler because it's not at 6.3. Now the filament in the 2AS15 does not operate at 6.3 volts. It's dropped down through these resistors here, but for argument's sake, we'll just say that it is. And this here, this filament is operating a little bit cooler. So if the filament operates a little bit cooler, this tube isn't going to draw as much current as it would if it draw if this filament was hot. So if this isn't going to draw as much current, the voltage on pin 5 is going to go high because we see we have a regulated 350 volt supply going through the tube. This is a little jumper inside the tube here and it goes up to the plate through a 1.8 mega ohm resistor. So if this is cooler, this voltage is going to go high. If this goes high, it's also going to bring the control grid voltage of this 6CZ5 a little higher too. So if this gets a little bit higher, the control grid voltage, this is going to draw heavier current between pin 9 and pin 7. If it does that, we will notice that the winding of this saturable reactor is also in line with the plate of this tube and this is going to draw more current across this winding. If this draws more current, this is going to pull this further into saturation, therefore upping the voltage across this point and supplying more AC voltage to the primaries of T750. If it does that, all these voltages are going to climb. And if they climb, then we're going to probably reach our 6.3 volt target. So now, just say we have overshoot and this has gone to 6.4 volts instead of 6.3. So now it's going to want to try and come back down again. And how it accomplishes this is now the filament in here will be very hot. This is drawing heavy current, so it's trying to pull pin 5 down to pin 2. So it's going to drop the voltage at this point, which is also going to drop the voltage on the control grid of the 6CZ5. If it drops the control grid voltage, this tube isn't going to pull as heavy current as it would in the other state, effectively letting off on this winding inside of this saturable reactor here and causing it to go out of saturation. If this goes out of saturation, the voltage on these two primary windings will drop down and these will all drop, causing the voltage to try and go down again. And that's how this circuit works. It's looking for equilibrium all the time. R799 here sets the equilibrium of this circuit by setting the heater voltage of this 2AS15. So that 2AS15 really is a special tube and it glows quite brightly. It's alarming when you first look in the power supply of a, a 555 oscilloscope because you see this tube glowing like a flashlight, but it's supposed to do that. And the reason it does that is because the cathode of that tube has no emissive coating on it. It's just a, a tungsten cathode with a tungsten filament. And what happens is that cathode has to glow and the filament has to glow that much brighter in order for this tube to have emission. Now since it's a, a, a tungsten cathode and filament and there is no emissive coating on it, this tube is very sensitive to voltage variation on the filament. So any slight voltage variation on the filament will cause this tube to either conduct more or to basically let off and let this go high. And that's how that tube works. So we say to ourselves, well, what happens if the filament opens? Because in most vacuum tubes, eventually the filament opens like a light bulb, right? So if it did that, all the voltages on this side would go high. They'd go screaming high, maybe even up to 8 volts. So the inventors of the 2AS15 tube put a little switch inside the tube that closes when the filament breaks. So it effectively pulls pin 5 right down to pin 2, shutting this tube off, letting this reactor go completely out of saturation, and all the voltages drop on this side, protecting your 100 plus tubes inside of your Tech 555 oscilloscope.
And that's how this power supply operates. So if you like this explanation and you like the video, please subscribe and give me a thumbs up and you'll automatically receive updates and know when I post new videos of strange electronic things and projects. Alright, see you later.